I felt today that the Lord gave me something that I do want to talk to you about because I believe it deals with your character as a Christian. How many of you believe that we as Christians should have character? We should have a Christian character that sets us apart uh, from the world around us. I believe if you're going to work and you're telling the people in the break room about Jesus, I think there should be something different about your life that draws them to you and ultimately to Christ. Because if, the, if your lifestyle is nothing different than the world and the sinful lifestyle of the world, why would they want that? They already have that. Does that make sense? So 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. I want to talk to you on the subject tonight of personal accountability. I've shared a lot of different things in getting started here, but hopefully that will give you kind of a, uh, an idea of the direction that we're headed. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to begin reading at verse number 7, and I'm going to show you through this why that I believe this applies to what we want to talk about. Verse number 7 says this, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Did anyone else catch that? want to be acceptable to Him. Verse number 10, For we must all, how many of us? All of us. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in His body, according to that He hath done, whether it be good or good. Or bad. So I want to talk to you tonight about personal accountability. And this is going to be a character message. This is going to deal with you as an individual. This is the kind of message that you don't look across the table at somebody else and go, Oh, he's talking to them. This is the kind of message that you don't think about five other people. So I wish they were here tonight. This is the kind of message that you stand in front of the mirror of God and you say, God, what was me? Check me. Look at me. What's going on within me? That's the kind of message that we're going to talk about tonight, personal accountability. If you bow your head for just a moment, I'm going to ask my wife, if she will, to say a uh, prayer over the Word tonight, that what God shows us and to open our hearts tonight. If I had to guess, most everybody here has had times before in your life that you've heard a story of something that happened in church that really made you think, what a shame. What, what must the world be thinking when they hear these kinds of things go on among Christians and among church folks? I've even heard people say it's no wonder that the world looks at the church the way it does. You ever heard a story about a pastor failing or somebody doing something and they call themselves a Christian and you think to yourself, man, if that's what Christianity is, then who would want anything to do with that? Have you ever thought that? And it's a shame that that kind of talk would be named among Christians. And I would tell you tonight, there are some people that are going to hate on the church if the church was at its absolute best. There are some people that are going to find reasons to ridicule, mock, and make fun. I don't know if it makes them feel better about their sin. I'm not sure exactly all that is involved in that. But I will tell you that the church, and especially them who are leading uh, in faith, are supposed to hold a standard of character, integrity, and morality that is above that that we, we see in the world. And if you agree, can you say amen to that? Um, but I... I came across one of those stories today, and it really, really bothered me. It bothered me on many different levels, probably first of all because I am a pastor, and it involved a pastor. It involved a church, and I pastor a church. It involved husbands and wives, and I'm married, and I've been married a long time. It involved people that have been hurt, and as a pastor, I've seen situations like this where people have been hurt. But in the story that I came across today, this is something that recently happened. And so uh, you probably haven't heard about it yet. You may, maybe you won't, I don't know. But there was a pastor 
in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee that this involved, but he committed adultery. And this is a pastor who was over a pretty large church. He started off with this church, and it was kind of a small work from what I understood, and grew the church till they had not just one location, but I think they had another location in Georgia, which they call it like a satellite church or something now. And if I'm not mistaken, they had at least hundreds, if not thousands, of members of this church. So this guy's a very charismatic leader. He's the type of person that gets up and he moves the crowd and he's well known for his speaking ability and all these sorts of things. But in the story, what they explained was is that at first, someone in a public place, apparently because he's well known in that area, somebody's seen him and he was with some other woman that's actually was an employee of that church. And he was there and in the video, he leans over and it appears as though they're kissing each other. And that was controversial in itself enough. I'm not real sure if this happened the same time the other part of this story developed. That I don't know. But not only that, but one day some of the folks in his church decided they were going to stop by and surprise the pastor and say hello or whatever. So, I mean, just think, just imagine what, how, how crazy that this would be. I'm hearing all this and I'm just cringing in my, my spirit But this group of people from his church stop by the house, they knock on the door, and lo and behold, the pastor's in there, Uh, one of them's wrapped in a towel, and one of them's got no clothes on, or pretty next to nothing, and the excuse that they offered up was that they were making hot dogs and chili, and somehow something got on their clothes, so they had to strip down to, you know, change clothes or something. Later on, we find out that there's no, that that wasn't the reason. Um, it's pretty obvious that that wasn't the reason why that they were like that. Well, eventually the story evolves that the wife of the husband, the pastor, the pastor's wife, she ends up filing for divorce. The husband to the other woman, he files for divorce. So now you got two families split up. And you would think that in all of this, that there would be a level of remorse to the pastor. And the pastor would be like, you know what? I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. I allowed my flesh to get the best of me. And step down, you know. But the problem is, is this is a pastor of an independent work. Anybody that doesn't understand this, I'm going to explain to you the difference between an independent work and an organized work. A lot of flack is given to organized uh, church communities because they say, well, it's, you know, all man. And people just boast in this independent idea. Well, I go to a non-denominational church or I go to an independent work. Well, there's pros and cons to that. One of the cons to an independent work can be, not always, there is no oversight. There is no authority over that person. So let's give you an example so you understand. I'm just using this as a teaching moment right here. So, for example, if that same scenario or something crazy like that happened in our church, what would happen in that situation? Would Pastor Myers be able to just keep right on pastoring like nothing ever happened? No. The Church of God... The state office would step in, and they would be the ones to handle what took place because I am accountable as a licensed minister within the Church of God. They would handle business. They would make sure things were done correctly. Well, in this situation, in the independent movement, that man has no one in authority over him, earthly person. They say things like, well, I'm accountable to God. Yes, we all are. But if you're not careful, if a man does not make himself accountable personally, You put yourself in a position where that later on if you change your opinion or your views or your ideas or you let Satan get a seat in your mind, you could take a church community who's worked together. They've sold spaghetti dinners and car washes and yard sales and tithed and gave and everything else. And now if they don't like it, they can just lump it and leave. Because if you tell them, look, I've been thinking about it. I don't think we're going to be... uh, I don't think we're going to be Trinitarian anymore. I think we're going to swing this ship another direction. We're all going to be apostolic now. And if you don't like it, leave. And there's nothing you can do about it. You have no recourse. So with all that being said, this was an independent, from all observation, this independent work. There's nobody above this man. And so I'm listening to this story play out. And they say that um, they, they played a video clip of this. They had a meeting. Some of the people in the church wanted to ask some questions. Well, what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to take some time off, but I'm going to preach the next couple of services or whatever. I think they had like a, 
I don't know, one of these big services like Christmas service or something coming up. And he says, I'm going to get up and, and I'm going to preach that service. And, um, and he gives some shallow excuse about how he's, whether I'm right, wrong, or whatever, you know, I, preaching is preaching and it, you know, people need the good news and blah, blah, blah. It was shallow. Well, eventually they play a clip of him with this meeting with these people in his church. And they're asking questions, and one of the things they want to know is, what are you planning to do in the long haul? Are you, are you, when you, are you going to continue to see this woman? He says, well, as long as the divorce proceedings are going on, we're not going to pursue anything. Well, what does that say? You know what I mean? That don't say a whole lot for the hot dogs and chili thing, does it? I mean, we were just cooking hot dogs and chili. So... Then they say, well, what we want to know is like, after the divorce is final, are you going to pursue each other? And he says, we will most likely pursue a relationship after the divorces are final. I don't know about you folks, but there are so many issues and so many things going wrong with that whole scenario. And I want to take you back to something, and I want to show you the reason why this troubles me, one of the, one of the many reasons. Because you got two people who are focused so much on their self, Maybe this, mar- maybe this man felt like his marriage wasn't that great. Maybe she felt like hers wasn't that great. I don't know. But they're both working in a ministry capacity. He is a leader of a church. He is a pastor, a senior pastor. And yet he sees no issue. And it's as if there's no remorse whatsoever that he's done anything wrong. I'm just going to take a couple services off and then I'll be right back at it. Is that the way that we're supposed to ministry is supposed to be? Does anybody else have a problem with that besides me? That troubles me. And I wanted to take you back because I want you to see something. Look at the damage that is being done. That is so self-centered of these two people to, to address this this way. Think about the kids involved on both sides of the families. Forevermore, this will stain those children's future, their lives, their reputations in the community. I mean, think about the kids. Think about the two other spouses involved in this and I thought to myself now this might be the crazy side of Pastor Myers but I thought that woman she's probably going to get what she wants when she finds out when they finally do get together and he's doing hot dogs and chili with somebody else you know what I mean because cheaters cheat that's what they do or whenever he finds out she's off cheating with somebody else I don't understand all of this I know that the Bible talks about the lust of the flesh and I know that if we're not careful, we can easily give ourselves to the wrong things. And I'm not here to try to be somebody's judge. That's not my courtroom. That's God's, that's God's job. But I am here as a teacher and as a preacher to take moments like that to remind us as a people, as Christians, we have an obligation to hold ourselves personally accountable. I wanted to talk to you about that because when I look into Scripture, I want you to look there with me for a moment at verses number um, 9 and verse number 10 especially. He said, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent that we may be accepted of Him. Now verse number 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things. In other words, those are the rewards. Whether it's good rewards, bad rewards. We must receive the things done in his body or in this body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That person, that's you, that's me, in the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be accountable and responsible for our choices. We can't just make decisions like, well, well, who cares? That's not the way that this goes. And some people will say things like, well, Pastor Myers, you know, isn't God a forgiving God? I believe He is. But I want to share something with you that worries me, that concerns me. I'm afraid that this once saved, always saved doctrinal view that some people have has made people think that they can just live any kind of way that they want and God's just going to overlook it like it's no big thing. Think of this. I've used this example before, so maybe this will make sense. But say you got two people that are broke. They ain't got no money. And they're supposed to be Christians. Let's say they're saved, sanctified, and claim to be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
And they're sitting on a curb one day talking about how broke they are. And they look across the street. Well, there's a bank over there. You know what? Maybe we can go rob that bank. And the other guy looks at him and says, no, man, we can't do that. We're Christians. Yeah, but wait a minute. We'll just go rob the bank, and when we're done, we'll say, God, forgive us. I call that, personally, premeditated sin. That is really pushing the envelope and taking the mercy and forgiveness of God for granted. And I'm not your judge, and I can't say what will happen, but I want to tell you one thing as a pastor, and I'm just being clear, I wouldn't even want to take that risk. Because here's what you're doing. You are forcing the hand of God. It's almost like a a child telling the parent, no, you're going to forgive me. You know what I'm saying? Do you see why that that is so dangerous? And I'm afraid there are people that go with that mindset. And you know this tonight, there's a lot of people that say, Pastor Myers, I believe you can backslide. Pastor Myers, I believe, I don't really believe in that once saved, always saved stuff. But you know what people live like they do? Even if they say they don't believe it, they live like they believe it. What do you mean? They're constantly sinning, and a lot of the times they don't even say, I'm sorry. They don't even say, God, forgive me. They don't ask God for mercy. And true repentance is to turn away from something. You can't just keep doing something every single day and say you repented. Repentance is to turn away from it. So there's a lot to be said about that. But I want you to see that from this one particular scripture, he is talking to us about our personal responsibility that will come into question, if you will, in the day of judgment when we stand before God. We will be responsible for those things that have been done in this life, in this body. And I don't know about you, I don't want to stand before God with defiled and dirty hands. You say, well, you know, I was saved. God cleansed me. Let me explain something to you. When you get saved, He washes you, right? He washes you. All of that sin that you have committed, He washes away that sin and He forgives you. But guess what? Once God forgives you and saves you, you have a responsibility, personal accountability. You have a responsibility to keep that garment unspotted. Isn't that what the Scripture says? Unspotted. Because when He comes back... Did you read in the Bible that he's coming back for a bride with a lot of blemishes and wrinkles and stains on his garment? No, that's not what the Scripture says at all. But he says when he comes back, he's coming back for a bride without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish on his garment. That's Bible. I didn't make that up. That is in the Scripture. How is that possible? That is possible by first salvation and second by us doing what the scripture tells us to make sure that we're not becoming spotted. That we're not uh, acquainting ourselves with things that are going to stain and mar this garment in the process. That is your responsibility. That is up, up to us to make sure we're doing that. But I wanted to share with you that because when you look at this text and what the Lord laid on my heart. I want to bring us all full circle to stand in front of a mirror for a little bit. Because personal accountability means you as an individual, me as an individual, standing before God. I don't have my wife there to vouch for me. My wife, can't, I can't lean on her righteousness or how she lived. I can't live on her example. I can't live by whatever she did. I have to stand in front of God responsible for me, not for my kids. Not for everybody else, and I'm not saying that what I teach them or lead them I won't be accountable for, but I'm trying to help you understand this is a personal thing. You, as an individual, you can't blame it all on everybody else. Well, you know the church I went to, and well, my pastor, you know this, and so and so and that. You are going to be accountable for you. It doesn't matter if your pa- your pastor was your dad. It doesn't matter if your, your uh, Sunday school teacher was your mother. You could be raised in church. None of those things will have any bearing on the fact that you as an individual have to have a personal accountability. That means that you have character. You have integrity. I believe it was Paul that said in one scripture that you obey God much more in my absence than in my presence. What was he saying? You know what he was saying? He was saying, don't hypocrite. Don't just come to church and do all this stuff at church and act a real good part here and then go to work and do something completely different. Go home in the privacy of your home and do something completely different. 
walk the walk and talk the talk. If you're going to be a Christian, be one. Don't just tell people I'm a child of God. Be one. Don't just tell everybody I've been changed, I've been transformed by the renewing of my mind. Live like it. Do it. Be it. Because that's what the world needs. This world has seen enough hypocrisy out of the church. It does not need another spoonful of hypocrisy. There's got to be a remnant that is willing to say, God purge me and help me to be different. Help me to be what you want me to be because there are people who need that example. I'm I'm supposed to be the city set up on a hill. I'm supposed to be the light. I'm supposed to be the salt because Christ shines through me. Is that not Bible? That is what we're supposed to do. But I want you to see that by looking at the Scripture that there is uh, an accountability that God requires through the commands that He gives us. And I want you to see something before I get into that because this is something I was thinking about on the way here. Do you realize that when you are a young man or a young woman, you have parents and you're living at home, it's a lot easier than you probably realize when you're a kid because your parents are responsible of making so many decisions for you. They're the ones that are responsible for making sure you got food. They're responsible for making sure you have a roof over your head, a place to sleep. They're responsible for making sure you get to school and you get an education. They're responsible for making sure that you have good social skills, that you have good manners, that you're a good, upstanding person. They set the platform for you. But guess what happens? There comes a time in your life when you are like that bird in the nest. And mom says, look here, baby, it's time for you to fly. I've been grooming you. I've been getting you ready. You've been growing your wings out. Your feathers are all developed. And you've heard me maybe tell the story before about how the eagle will prepare her nest. What she does is when she builds the nest, this is how awesome God is in in nature. That eagle will for, uh, I I guess you say foretell or foresee the need later on through the way God has designed and created them that when she starts picking out the material to build her nest, she builds the bottom of that nest with prickly uh, thorns and things that will poke them. And what does she do? She takes her own uh, feathers and down and different things and puts it on top of that stuff. Well, what happens is when mama realizes it's time for you to get out of the nest and learn to fly, you can't stay in the nest forever, she starts pulling back all that stuff in the nest. And what does the babies do? They start stepping around. They're stepping on all that uh, prickly, hurtful stuff that's poking them and it's uncomfortable. And guess what it makes them do? It makes them get out of the nest because... You don't want, this is the thing, what I'm trying to show you is that mama purposely makes the nest uncomfortable. Sometimes God does that with us. But I told you that because what you have to understand is that as kids, we, ha- we rely so much on our parents. But guess what? Whether it's 18 or whether it's 16 or whether you're 22 or whatever, there comes a time, right, Miranda? You guys got married recently. You step out on your own. You start realizing when you have to pay your own bills. And you got to sit around and go, okay, whether do we keep the phone bill on this month or do we let the, the insurance lapse or uh, we, well, we're going to go to the grocery store, we're going to get raviolis and some uh, potted meat and some ra- ramen noodles or, or what are we going to do, you know? You start learning a lot when you step out on your own and you have a lot of responsibility. But here's the thing. When a child steps out from under the umbrella of his parents' authority and decision-making, they step into this massive horizon of the ability to choose and do as they want to. But with that massive horizon comes a lot of responsibility, consequences, or rewards for our decisions. So it was wonderful... To be able to have this freedom to do what I want to, but kids don't always understand. Am I right? Because most of us are adults here, and we understand. We oh, it's such a great thing to be an adult, and I think it is good to be an adult. But there's times I thought to myself, I'd much rather just be propping myself up, coming home from school with a giant popcorn bowl full of Fruit Loops, eating that, and I had to worry about what's going on with the bills or anything else, and just go to school and sit there and pop bubble gum and and fill out some paperwork or something. You know what I mean? That'd be a whole lot easier than some of this mess we got to deal with as adults. But if I can just help you to understand that as adults, you remember where he said in the scripture, he said, when I become a man, I put away childish things. 
There has to be a level of of, uh, personal accountability. Do you realize if you don't hold yourself accountable, the avalanche, the domino effect of everything that can go wrong in your life? You realize how many things? I got to thinking about it. And as adults, when we enter that broad horizon, a sphere where our ability to have personal accountability will greatly affect so many things in our life, it affects things like relationships. If you don't have personal accountability... You're, you're going to have poor relationships. You ever met anybody that they don't hold themselves accountable to anything? And they can't keep a wife, they can't keep a girlfriend, they can't keep friends, they can't keep a boyfriend. Every time you turn around, it's another Joe Schmo coming in. And they have no accountability in their life. It'll affect your careers. If you don't have accountability and you don't show up for work, and you don't, the night before, you know, if you, if you are the type to get up late, you're going to set your clothes out. Get a shower the night before. Don't get up five minutes past time you're supposed to get up and then think you're going to get it all pulled together and think you're going to show up on time. That's personal accountability. That's just a small thing that I'm talking about. But it is an example of how the reason why some people can't keep a job. It's the reason why some people are never going to have anything in life is because they have no personal accountability. Our parents might have taught us this. But whether we enact it or not, we on the, we're on this broad horizon with all these great ability uh, to make choices and do what I want to do, when and where I want to do it. But with that level of, of freedom comes a responsibility to hold myself accountable. Sister Kim, you've been working, doing what you do, where you're working at. I'm sure you're a great employee, but it don't happen easily. There's days you don't want to go to work. Personal accountability says, you know what, I got some bills to pay. I got to get up and go to work. I don't feel like it. Personal accountability are those times when somebody's screaming at you and you want to just stand up and tell them, take this job and go somewhere with it. You know what I mean? But you sit down in your seat because you know I can't afford to lose this job. Personal accountability. I'm telling you, I was telling him about the other day. I remember when I, my wife and I had just got married. We were living in, on the border of Gate City, Virginia and Kingsport, Tennessee. There's about six foot of snow on the ground outside. I was trying to make sure I was managing things. I thought I was smart, you know. So I would turn the hot water heater off so we weren't running a hot water heater when we weren't using it. It was just the two of us. So every day when it was time to take a shower, we'd go in there and take, turn the hot water heater on before time. Well, I stayed up too late the night before, and I thought, well, I'll just get a shower in the morning. Well, guess what I forgot to do? Turn the hot water heater on. There's six foot of snow out on the ground, and I got to go to work, and I need a shower. And if anybody knows me, i got to have a shower. I, ain't get, I am not going out without a shower. So I will never forget screaming like a woman, running underneath the water, then running back out from underneath the water. <laughs> It was the coldest water I've ever been in in my entire life. But I have to be accountable for my own decisions. I can't blame somebody else, not somebody else's fault. But you learn through trivial or life trials how to, eat, how to understand the importance of making myself accountable. But you know what? I remember laying on my back underneath the house. Now, I'm married now. We were like you guys. We had long been married. I'm laying on my back. And I'm packing unfaced insulation that's that far away from my face. It's freezing cold outside. I'm covered with muddy snow water and warehouse soot. The whole pack of insulation had to roll over because I was the you know I was the green guy. I'd roll this big old four pack of stuff through the snow down a big hill. Nearly fell on top of me. It's I got snow muddy water all over me, and now I'm soaking wet. And anybody that knows anything about insulation, that glass sticks to you when you are wet. And I got insulation unfaced in this far from my face. And I'm packing it in the floor. And my wife can tell you, before we got married, I would have been like, this is not for me. Bye. I am not doing this. But I had a rent payment that was going to be due. I had bills that would be need to be paid. My new newlywed wife needed to eat. I needed to eat. So you hold yourself accountable. I'm building this up to help you understand the importance of just everyday life. It will not only affect your uh, careers, but it'll infa- it'll affect your influence. If you're not holding yourself accountable personally for the things you do, it will affect your influence. Do you know people don't want to look up to somebody who says one thing and does a completely different thing? Now, 
I don't have ministry on here, but I will tie this influence into ministry. And let me explain to you like this. I told you the story earlier about that ministry situation. I was sharing something similar with another preacher recently that somebody brought an accusation against. The best way I know to explain this to you is like this. If you are a chef and you can really throw down in the kitchen and you may have gone to school and you are one of the best chefs around, well, if you go and you ain't got a very good people skill and you're that good of a chef, they'll stick you in the kitchen back there somewhere and let you do your thing back there and they'll hire you. But let me tell you something about ministry. If you ever lose people's respect in ministry, forget it. Because everything in ministry rises and falls on respect. The reason that some of the people are in this room today is because they have a level of respect for Sister Myers and I. And if there was no respect, their people wouldn't walk across the street to hear you. They wouldn't spit on you if you were on fire. A lot of people. Because ministry has so much to do with respect. If you are telling us to do one thing and doing something completely different out of the other side of your mouth, we don't want to hear anything you've got to say. You've lost our respect. That is what I'm trying to help you to understand as a Christian in your home, as a parent. Think about this. If you feel that way about your pastor and your pastor's wife, how do your kids feel about you? Because your kids look up to you the same way you look up to your pastor and pastor's wife. Your grandkids do. They look up to you. And if they see that wavering, that up and down, you say one thing out of one side, well, you know, we, we love the Lord and we're serving God. And I witnessed to a lady at work today and this and that and the other. But they see you doing all kind of manner of other things. What kind of message is that sin? You may not realize it because your kids may never say a word to you. But you have lost their respect. And if they don't respect you, guess what happens? They write you off. Is that a fact? Is that true? In many cases, that is very, very true. And that is the reality that people don't see. That is why that even though you're an adult, even though you have the freedom to make a ton of decisions on your own, do what you want, when you want, how you want, raise your kids the way you want. Well, my, well, you ain't raising my kids. I'm raising my own kids. Well, you better make sure you're personally holding yourself accountable. Well, you don't pay my bills. Well, you better make sure you're holding yourself personally accountable for your bills. Because here's what a lot of people in this generation do. They go out, they blow a bunch of money on stupid stuff, and then turn around and beg somebody to help them out of the hole they got themselves into. Say amen. Because, well, oh me or oh my or amen or something. I've been guilty of that. I've done it before. I learned from that. I made big mistakes in my life. I'm trying to help you see personal accountability. Let me explain to you why personal accountability is important in your influence. And I'll use myself for an example. I have to remind myself all the time. I have kids. I have a kid now, son. I have a grown man for a kid. And I have a daughter-in-law who I love more than I could ever imagine, and my grandkids, who that I'm their pastor. I'm their father-in-law. I'm their father. And sometimes I'm his boss, his employer, his Bank of America. No, in all seriousness, I have to remember that. I have to remember that I'm not, that's not just my wife. I'm her pastor. And my influence over her can greatly affect her view of so many spiritual things as well. Imagine now, Your own family. Now, husbands like to tout this whole thing about, well, I'm the head of this house. Well, act like it. Act like it. Act like the head of the house. Be the head of the house. Instead of, well, I'm the head of the house. I'm going to do what I want to do. You're going to like it. You know. Well, if you're going to be the head of the house, be the spiritual head that God intended you to be. Otherwise, don't use that scripture to just get what you want when you want to. Be the man of God. That's why the Lord said to love your wife as Christ loved the church. So you might be the head of the house, but are you loving your wife like Christ loved the church? It's just an example. But your influence will greatly be impacted if you don't hold yourself accountable. I'll tell you an example of what I mean. I worked with a guy, and he said he was a Baptist, a deacon Baptist. 
or maybe I said that wrong, a deacon at a Baptist church. And at work, we would be working together. This guy's all the time singing gospel songs and all this, singing and, you know, oh, great. That's wonderful. He listened to the same kind of music I did then, and I kind of thought highly of the guy. It's wonderful. He's been married to his wife for many years. Well, at one point, our company had an out-of-town job where that all uh, several different people were going to go down south. I want to say it was Fort Lauderdale or Miami or somewhere. While these men were down there, this guy and his brother, they both worked at the same company. And his brother, he was, he was far from what you'd call a Christian. He was one of those people that just say whatever and don't care what anybody thinks. Well, he, they went down there. So they were, while they were there, they all slipped out one night after work and went to a topless nightclub, got drunk, had a bunch of drinks, and he was right there with them. Well, when they all came back, I, of course, I wasn't there. I didn't know anything about it. When they all came back, we were on a job one day, and the subject of Christianity came up, and I was trying to witness to that brother of that man about how good God is. And he stopped me. He said, I don't want to hear any of what you've got to say. What do you mean? You know, God's, God's real. God's good. He said, I don't want to hear any of that garbage. He said, my brother, who you see and you're around all the time, he said, he's not what you think. He said, do you know that when we went out of town, he said that his poor wife's back at home. He was out with a woman. He said, could have brought her back some kind of disease or who knows what. Out of topless nightclub, but he's a deacon in the church. He said, so I don't want to hear anything you got to say. What I'm trying to help you understand is that man not holding himself personally accountable led to the fact that somebody may never decide to serve God. His influence was so foul that it caused a negative impact on his family. Can you imagine seeing that? And somebody saying, hey, that's what I believe Christianity is. But I'm going to tell you something. I am thankful for the people that can see around that garbage. I really am. I'm thankful for the people that won't look at one person like he did and say, the whole, paint a whole church like that with one broad brush. Because I want you to know, the same way that God told Elijah, he says, son, I got 7,000 haven't bowed and eat a bail. I told you here a while back about some of the statistics and stuff, about certain level amount of youth pastors and pastors doing things. One thing I can tell you I am thankful for is that not everybody's doing garbage. Not everybody's doing silly things and foolishness that would be uh, contrary to the Spirit and Word of God. There are some people who have a genuine love for God who hold themselves accountable. This is, the, this is the honest truth. I'll give you two examples tonight. My wife, I'll use her first. Well, she came home from work when she was working at the hospital. And um, if I was to say you're beautiful or you're pretty or... You know, somebody may hit on you. My wife would tell me, oh, ain't nobody interested in me. I'm so ugly and all this kind of stuff. I don't know if any of you ladies are like that, but my wife does that. I love her to death, but she don't think of herself very highly. So one day she goes to work, and she come home, and she said something kind of strange happened today. And I said, oh, really? What was that? Well, some guy was kind of hitting on her. He was like, Oh, you smell really good. Your hair's pretty. This, that, and the other. It was kind of going down that whole road of complimentary flattery stuff and was leading up to making it sound like he was kind of coming on to her, if you will. And she holds herself personally accountable. I don't know if any of you other ladies do this, but my wife has a way of shutting things down easily. If she thinks things are out of hand, I don't know. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? They say, yeah, my husband loves my hair too. Yeah, my husband told me that, that he thinks my hair is beautiful. My husband picked out this perfume. There's ways that's you holding yourself personally accountable. That's the way you make sure that you are guarding yourself. Because let me tell you something. You're an adult. You have the free will and the ability to do a lot of things on your own time and nobody would ever know. There are some of you in this room that if you wanted to, on the way home you could stop by the store and get a big bottle of alcohol or something and you could be drinking it sipping on it here and there with nobody ever know but you you could hide it how do i know because i've counseled with people that have done it you have to have a level of personal accountability where you hold yourself accountable 
And you say, if I'm going to be tempted in that place, I probably shouldn't go to that place. If that's going to lead me into something, I, I probably ought to stay off that website. Or I probably ought not watch that thing because I know me. You know what I mean? It's like I, we were having a conversation here a while back about somebody who said that they once had a problem with gambling. Well, I don't want to, I'm not going to put myself in harm's way if that was an issue that I had in the past. I don't want to make myself vulnerable. I'm holding myself personally accountable. There's also been times before I don't have to really hold myself personally accountable because I have a son that will do it for me. So I told you about my wife at work. We were on a job not far from here in the Maitland Center. And this lady comes over. She's the one that's kind of like the in-between for that company. It was actually, I don't know if you remember that Farmville or something game on Facebook. They actually the designer, Zynga or something was the name of the company. Big corporation. And I'm over there trying to figure out, like, what are we supposed to do? And the lady, I'm up on stilts, if I'm not mistaken. And the lady's standing there, and she's twisting and flipping around and, talking and I, I don't pay any I don't think anything of it and then she said then she says oh and by the way if you ever need anything just let me know I mean anything I was like man that's a weird feeling you know what I mean that just feels really odd awkward that's a weird feeling it just I've just felt like like I almost felt like I just sinned or something you know what I mean <laughs> and what makes it even worse is when I got my son standing right there and so Guess what he decided to do when we get home? Yeah. I, I mean, I was just going to, like, let it go. But he had to make sure my wife knew, oh, guess what happened at work today? So then my wife's like, who is this? Who is she? You know, pastor's wife. Like, what are you going to do? You're going to go in there and, you know, slap her or something? I don't know. What's up? I'm telling you that because we as people, we have to hold ourselves personally accountable. I've told you the story about Joseph and the coat of many colors. I've, I've made a statement before about how impressive that it is that he was, he was an Old Testament man of God. He, he wasn't what we would call somebody baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yeah, we got people today that say, hey, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, that don't hold themselves accountable like he did. He, he had a woman who by all intents and purposes... You go look up the leaders and kings back there, Egyptian uh, princes and princesses. They were not ugly people. You show me some, some king or prince with all this different stuff and notoriety who's going to purposely marry somebody that ain't attractive. That's probably not going to happen. Most likely, this woman was really good looking. And yet she comes on to a young, prince, a young man, J, uh, Joseph, and he left his coat in her hand. You know what that is? That is a level of personal accountability. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to stoop that low. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give you an example because I like people to see the human side of me as a pastor. Because sometimes people look at a pastor almost like there's doves flying around you whenever you're at home and, you know, oh, angels everywhere and that kind of thing. I just want you to understand I'm a real human being like you are too. I went to Sam's today. And I was walking around, I was looking for different stuff, and I saw this three-pack, and Sam's, they got big quantities of everything. I saw this three-pack of these air fresheners, and I thought, I don't really like whatever that smell is there, but these two smells here are pretty good. Maybe if I took this one out of the box and put an apple one in there, so I have two apples and one pumpkin smell, and my wife would really like that. So I'm standing there looking at it, and I'm like, well, I'll just have to, I would have to open the box up. And then I thought, well, if I did that, what, what if they've seen me do that? That might not be the right thing to do. I'm playing all this crazy stuff in about the preacher. This is all going through my mind. And I thought to myself, I can't do that. That wouldn't be right. So I just put the box back on the shelf and grabbed the one that had the one can in it that I didn't really want and paid for it like that. I'm just trying to tell you that I have to hold myself personally accountable. There is a lot of things at stake. And if you as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a leader, if you don't acknowledge and realize what is at stake, you're going to lose a lot. Because there are, I'll give you an example of this, about three years ago maybe it was, we hear a lot of times, well, this man cheated on his wife. This man cheated. You'd be surprised how many times, I think there's been like three situations that I've counseled where a woman cheated on her husband in the last couple of years. And whenever you sit down and talk to people that are going through this, it's always a sad situation because people get really hurt 
by these things. But when you don't hold yourself personally accountable, you hurt a lot of people. When you don't hold yourself personally accountable, it's a selfish thing. It's about what I want in the moment. It's about what I want to do in the moment. Anybody else believe or agree with me that that's not God? It's not godly. And that's a very sad thing. So it affects your careers, your your influence. It affects your freedom. If you don't have any personal accountability, your level of freedom in life, you might end up in prison if you can't have personal accountability. Your financial status. If you don't have any personal accountability, you may never own anything. You may be broke and have a credit score of minus three the rest of your life because you have no personal accountability. That's what being an adult is. That's what maturity and being... I'm not telling you my credit score is perfect, so please don't leave here thinking that. I'm just telling you that you've got to hold yourself personally accountable. I told somebody the other day, I said, most of the majority of the mess on my credit is medical bills, and a lot of it is from my kids when they were at home and from, from my wife and I going to the hospital. That's the majority of it. So all throughout the Bible, I'm going to share this with you before that we end up getting close to the close on this. All throughout the Bible, the commands of God reveal the need for us to hold ourselves accountable. And I want to show you, this is just random. I just prayed and let the Lord speak into my mind. These are random things that you and I will recognize when I mention them. But that is the reason we're held accountable to keep the oil in our vessels and our lamps trimmed and burning. That's your responsibility. That's your personal level of accountability. I can't blame that on my wife if my oil or my lamp is not trimmed and burning. I can't blame it on my pastor or somebody else. I am accountable. I'm personally accountable for whether or not there's oil in my lamp and the wick's been trimmed. I'm accountable whether I'm working out my own salvation with fear and trembling. People talk about, well, everybody's supposed to work out their own salvation. Get out of my lane. Get out of my business. A lot of times when people say that kind of stuff, they just want to sin in peace, and they don't want you to say anything about it. That's really what it equates to. But at day's end, the people who make a big deal about that, and they say, well, I'm supposed to work out my own salvation. Yes, don't forget to read the rest of that verse with fear and trembling. I mean, that's pretty serious. If you're working out your salvation with fear and trembling, that means you're doing it with great concern. I want to make sure I'm holding myself accountable to do the right thing in this moment. How many of you know that there's some temptation you can face that is not easy? Let's just be real and honest. I mean, if you used to be a real bad alcoholic and you love the taste of that whatever beer or that wine cooler or that whatever fireball liquor, whatever it was, you just love the taste of it. And then there you are sitting in the living room watching Little House on the Prairie and fireball liquor commercial comes on. And they got ice sliding down the side of a bottle or a can and they pop the top and smoke comes out of the top and you can already taste it in your mouth. Let's don't be act like that we're not human Because the flesh, this right here, do you know the flesh was created from the dirt? Have you ever wondered to yourself the reason why that our flesh is so magnetized by the world? Because it came from the world. It's of the world. That flesh has cravings and wants to do things. That's why we have to keep our body under subjection. We have to crucify the flesh. That's all Bible. But you have to realize we got to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. That means I'm personally accountable to make sure that I'm working out my salvation. Third, whether our hand is on the plow and our eyes are not looking back. I'm personally accountable to make sure that I'm not doing this. That I'm, you know, I'm focused. I'm making sure that I'm plowing straight. I've got both hands on the plow and I'm doing what God called me to do. Is any of this making sense? I'm personally accountable. Not only that, but whether uh, we're being doers of the word and not hearers only. That's what the Bible said. It said, be you hearer, be you doers, not just hearers only. I'm accountable to make sure that I'm not just going to church hearing what the preacher's saying, but not actually doing it. That's my responsibility. Not only that, but being holy in all manner of conversation. That's what the Bible tells us that. That means that those moments when we're tempted to tell some nasty joke that we have been told in the past, and everybody in the break room is laughing their eyeballs out, but is, is it something that will mar your reputation? Is it something that you should be saying? Is it something you should be doing? There's a lot of things you've got to take into consideration because you can easily lose your influence, like we talked about earlier, by simply not being careful in your conversation, your manner of conversation. We talked about how that things can be tempting. 
Do you know that there are certain things that we should not be talking about? Most of us are adults. We understand. I'll keep this adult. As a husband and wife, there are things that you have no business talking about to other people. Am I right? There are some things that are between you. And don't be surprised if you're at work talking about stuff in your marriage to somebody else and then they start seeking out your spouse or wanting to have an affair with them or having some sort of lustful desire towards them or even having a negative opinion of them because of the things you've said about them. I've been in construction for a long time and I've heard some things that husbands have said about their wives before and their manner of conversation and yet they claim to be a Christian that was not what a Christian should be talking about. And I'll leave it at that. We've got to have a holy conversation. Um, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. These are all biblical things in the Bible, verses that we pull out of the Scripture that I just wanted to use for an example to show you you have a personal accountability to keep myself unspotted from the world, to forgive that we might be forgiven. If you, want, if you expect God to forgive you and you're not forgiving, you hold a grudge, you don't let stuff go, how are you going to stand before God and expect Him to hold to His promise of forgiveness if you can't forgive anybody else. Not just that, but every idle word. The Bible talks about we're going to give an account for every idle word. That means just the you know, casual things that just come out of your mouth. Things you say, like we talked about the conversation. The Bible tells us to give no place to the devil. I am personally accountable to not give place to the devil. I don't put myself in that position. I saw where somebody made a comment about the story I told you about the pastor and the lady employee and the, all that whole that church mess up in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And somebody made the statement that a lot of that problem started by them breaking an, uh, a moral or ethical rule, I guess you could say, by that pastor counseling that woman by herself. You see, the saints of old used to have certain kind of ethical barriers or unwritten rules that we had to kind of keep ourselves under the zone of protection. Now, I've told ladies before, like Sister Linda, at Sister Linda's age and my age, I'm not saying that she's 190 years old, but she's more like my mom. I don't think as much of that kind of thing, and I don't think she does either. But using practical common sense, if there's ever any question of something, you should be very careful not to put yourself in that position. You don't put yourself in that position, you don't have to worry about it. As, as much, I guess you should say. Give no place to the devil. I told you earlier the Bible talked about husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church. That's a personal thing of accountability. I don't know any other way to uh, impress this on your mind, of the importance of it, because I've covered everything that I can think of with the Lord's help tonight. But I do want you to leave here understanding there is a lot at stake. There's so much at stake. Everything that you let your ears hear, everything you let your eyes look at, everything you let your hands touch, and every place you let your feet carry you can be an opportunity for the devil to get a foothold in your life to ruin your testimony, to destroy your marriage. How do you know I've watched it happen? I've actually watched it happen. I've pastored people and watched it happen. And the best thing I could do is help you as a child of God to remember, if you will make yourself a personally accountable, you have less to worry about. What does personally accountable look like? That means when there's a thing of temptation, you're not too big of a man or too big of a woman to pick up a phone, call your husband or your wife or a friend and say, hey, would you pray for me right now? you pray with me right now? You know, I like the fact that you can have friendships. There's not a lot of questions. Nobody has to explain anything. I'm, I'm really struggling right now. Hey, would you pray with me? Send a text message. Hey, Pastor, would you pray for me, please? I'm really having a hard time with something. Because at the end of the day, the regret on the backside and the guilt on the backside of our offenses are sometimes something that is so hard to live with that people don't even want to live anymore. People commit suicide sometimes because they're eat up with guilt. I want to close by telling you this. I was talking with someone the other day, and has anyone ever had a family member or you knew somebody that practiced cutting? Where they cut themselves? It's very sad. 
and I do, I, I know people that practice that, but I was talking with someone here a while back, and one of the things that had came up, there's several different mental reasons why somebody might do that, but I was, somebody I was talking with was telling me that one of the reasons why people cut sometimes is because they're so consumed with guilt over the things that they've done. It's almost, it's almost like a self-punishment. It's like I'm going to hurt myself for doing things I know I shouldn't do. They don't need a parent to whip them, bend them over the bed, and give them a few licks with a paddle. That is their way of hurting themselves. That's not the only reason why people do it, but that, that in itself to me hurts my heart to think that someone could be living with so much guilt and the weight of that that they would go to that extreme. If you just hold yourself personally accountable... It makes things so much easier. And I do feel like saying this because I think that this is very important while we're on the subject. If you don't open yourself up something to a thing, you will rarely ever have to struggle with the images, the ideas, or the thoughts of whatever that thing is. I was counseling with a group of young boys some years ago, and the subject of internet pornography and pornography in general came up and I mentioned to those boys I said here's something that some of you guys may not realize whenever I was a young man I was about 10 maybe 11 years old Um, this was long before the internet too I lived right next to a house there in Tiberias with some really really sketchy rough people they could have been some folks living on Great Street um And I remember that they would go over there and get high, drink, do drugs, and kids from the neighborhood would come in and out of that house. One of the craziest things, the the mama of that house, she would get a big old thing, a red man in her mouth, and she would chew that red man, as the old lady would, and she'd spit it right on the floor in the house. You ever know anybody like that? And I remember being over there as a kid, 10, 11 years old, and I remember them having full-blown... x-rated movies going on their television and I seen it I watched it we laughed we made it a joke but once you see those things once you open up the mind to those things it's very difficult to close that door to where you never have those struggles ever again in your life so what you have to do you have to make yourself personally accountable when I was counsel with those young boys I told them I said when you feel the temptation to introduce yourself or open up doors that's why I shared the meme the other day you guys may have seen it on my Facebook if you don't open that door you may never have to struggle with that because there's some things you can open up yourself to that you will you may struggle for the rest of your life with that temptation you may be fought with that the rest of your life is anyone here can humbly admit that to me anyone ever said you know I I always wondered what it would be like to drink so I, I started drinking. I, I had a little bit of alcohol, and I actually enjoyed it. And now to this day, I have to struggle with it. I open myself up to certain illicit things. We're living in a generation right now where a lot of our young people are being so indoctrinated with the idea that homosexuality and lesbianism and all these things are, are, are okay that we're watching a lot of our young people that are practicing this and they're opening themselves up to things that they will always be, even if you get freedom and relief, that does not mean that those images, those ideas, those struggles won't constantly come back to your mind in your adult life. That's why I'm telling you tonight, don't open up the door. That's the best thing to do. Keep yourself personally accountable. In closing tonight, I want to ask you the question, is anybody else here tonight feel like that in this generation that we as a church need to make sure we're making ourselves personally accountable? Any of you guys feel that? Have you ever watched anybody that claimed to be a Christian that really made a negative influence on, on maybe your or somebody else's view because of the way they lived? And don't be that person.